Hi everyone. Um, oh, my camera's so dirty. Look at that. One sec. How's everyone doing today? Um, yeah, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Woohoo. Um, I don't really know what's so exciting, but um, hi. Uh, welcome to week two of this super exciting course. Um, I'm glad that everyone got their labs all submitted. Um, for week one, um, as you might have all figured out, we have, like, so we auto mark your labs. So we have a 5 p.m. Monday deadline. We auto mark your labs, and then um, you get those marks um, <clears throat> to you once your tutor confirms them, basically. So uh, you get marked off this week for lab one. You talk to your tutor, they'll quickly look at your stuff and they'll give you a mark. Um, don't be alarmed if your tutor kind of reads through things quickly. We kind of ask them not to spend too much time marking labs so they can spend more time helping you. Um, quiz 1 is also released. Um, you can click on quiz 1, you can make a submission. Quizzes aren't easy easy. I definitely wouldn't call them like straightforward, um, but you know, we have to make them a little bit challenging. Otherwise someone will figure it out and just share the results with people. Um, and some of this content won't be taught until um, today. So you can pretty much do all of the quiz after today, which is super exciting. Okay, so let's get stuck into it. So where we were last week is that last week we um, started off doing our, um, our performance analysis or analysis of algorithms, as I have so kindly called it. Um, and we started this off a little bit um, where we kind of jump straight into the measuring the program time. Um, we talked about the different times and then I think we analyzed a sum program. So if you're not familiar with this in the recording, um, then go back and watch the previous one. Um, if you're not familiar with this, if you're live, then I don't know, pause this and go back and watch the previous one. You can just unpause the live one later. Um, but we did kind of cover the basics of how to essentially find the timing of a program um, in Linux. Um, which was super interesting because we could actually see if you remember that there was a linear pattern when it came to summing numbers so that if we had a thousand numbers it took you know a thousand units of time and if we had ten thousand numbers it took ten thousand units of time so everything was super super linear um just before we go on i've i've turned my mic volume up a little bit just so that it's like closer to what i'd expect from um like if you were listening to music it should be about the same is it is it too loud for anyone like is it ever saturating or or kind of maxing out or is it all all g great okay so um the sum one is a super easy program we kind of just did that to get it out of the way but what we're really interesting uh interested in is looking at um a more complicated program right so the sum one is <laughs> Thank you for your feedback, extensive feedback. Um, but we're going to have a look at a sorting program. Now, sorting is something that comes up a lot in this course later on, um, though it's worth talking about now because sorting is a really basic and simple kind of algorithm um, that you can write. And um, there's going to be about five or six sorts that we talk about in this course in like week eight or nine. But in the meantime, um, we just want to talk about one. And this is one of a very a set of very basic sorts. And this one is a sort that we call bubble sort. Now, sorting is a concept you should get because you've all done it at some point in your life. You've sorted a deck of cards, you've sorted a bunch of pieces of paper, you've sorted video games on a shelf. Like I don't know what kinds of things you sort, but you've sorted things before, right? Maybe you've sorted cake mixes by alphabetical order. Um, and yeah, no, a bunch of you would have kind of done bubble sort. Now, the reason I like teaching bubble sort um, personally is because I think, well, 
I think a bunch of people have kind of seen it around, but it's also conceptual. Like it's it's a it's a uh, you know it's a kind of thing you could teach children, right? That's what I like about it. It's not really maybe the algorithm you'd go to always to sort it, but um, I feel like if I was twelve years old and you told me to you know describe to you a system for sorting numbers, um, this would kind of be the one. Now, what's really interesting about this kind of sort, which is different from sorts we'll get into later, is that this one doesn't really require um, some extra like space. So like uh, again, if you were if you were to give a child a bunch of cards, and these cards were all numbered, you know, four and two and six and three and one and seven, and you told them to sort them, um, now typically what they do is they grab this card and they drag it down here and then they grab this card and they drag it down here and they grab this card and they drag it down here and they do this right this is how they would sort it but you can understand from a programming perspective this would actually require more memory right because we essentially have um, you know an array which is our original list to sort and then we decide we want to create a new one just by like dragging them down so we end up having to create more memory now Bubble sort avoids this. That doesn't mean that it's better, but it certainly avoids it. And it basically avoids it just by essentially doing lots and lots of swaps. So let's just pay attention to this uh, diagram. I might see if I can refresh the page so it starts again. But the general gist of bubble sort is that it moves from the left, where the three is, and it moves to the right. Um, and essentially, it just looks at pairs of numbers. And if the pairs are the wrong way around, it just swaps them. And it just keeps doing that forever and ever and ever until the whole list is sorted. So conceptually it's a very straightforward algorithm right it swaps that it'll swap that it'll swap that it'll swap that it'll swap that and then it won't swap the last two and then it'll keep going swap that swap that one swap this one doesn't need to swap the next two or the next two or the next two right and it just keeps doing that over and over again until they're all sorted um, and if we look at that algorithmically just so we can understand the code <coughs> um, I don't think the code is necessarily excessively straightforward, though the general structure of it is pretty simple. This, there's two loops. The outer while loop here, um, that one is basically just saying, let's just keep sweeping through the list repeatedly until it's sorted, right? It's literally saying, let's just keep going through everything until it's all sorted, and I'm just going to do that infinitely. Um, and then the second for loop inside of that is saying, okay, well, I'm being told that I have to go through the list. It, uh, repeatedly, but the second for loop is actually doing the the one by one through the list. Um, so it's actually moving the red pairs across. So that second for loop is moving the red pairs across, and the first while loop is what causes it to go back to the start every single time. So we've got a loop within a loop, right? Um, and it's pretty straightforward. The outer loop says keep going. Um, the inner loop says let's move through all of the elements, um, and then we simply compare the comp compare the pair. Isn't that an ad? Compare the pair. It's an glasses ad. No, insurance ad, if anyone remembers these from television. Um, so, you know, we basically compare the pair, and if the one on the left is bigger than the one on the right, they're in the wrong order, so we swap it. Um, and this is the swapping code here. So those three lines there are essentially um, swapping the two numbers around. Like, that's a basic, you've probably done this in 1521 or 1511. You know, if you want to swap two numbers, you create a temporary variable, and then you just, like, rotate them all around, and then it's all good. Um, yeah, what's the weird handshape? Is it like that? An industry super fund. Um, so <clears throat> that's the algorithm. Um, we keep sweeping till it's sorted. And each time we sweep, we go through a pair at a time. We compare the pair. They're the wrong way around. We swap them. And you'll notice the only hard part to follow this program is to, to follow this little sorted Boolean because it's a little bit complicated, but it's like you kind of have to start off assuming that it's not sorted to enter the while loop. But every time you enter the while loop, you, you basically say, all right, before we do this sweep, I'm going to assume that it's uh, sorted until I'm proven wrong. So basically, from the time it does that first pair comparison, it's like, yep, everything's sorted. And once it swaps a pair, it's like, ah, oh, nah, sorry. And this is the flag that causes it to keep going. So you can kind of understand this flow that on the very last loop, when all the numbers are finished sorting, this is set to true to start, but then we never swap anything, and therefore we never set it to false. So therefore it just like actually leaves the loop. So that's what a bubble sort is, right? Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, 
Joseph says, does false represent an integer since the var is an int type? Yeah, so in this case, I've just used um, true and false as hash defines here as ints. We can use um, standard bool.h and other things, but I just wanted to keep this example really simple so that you can see how basic it is. Um, now, yeah, clean set of braces. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to time this program, which is the kind of fun part. So I've got this program, uh, bubblesort.c here, and we're going to run it. I'm going to go into 2.1, which is the lecture we had. Inside my sort folder, um, I'm going to open sort.sorc.c. I'm going to open sort.c. Um, and you can see that what's actually like, so this is the sorting algorithm that comes from the slides itself. Um, I put the prototype above here, and then I've got my main function, right? Because we always want to put our main function at the top. Um, and the prototype is a forward declaration. And then we have a really simple program that basically creates an array, reads numbers in from command line, sorts the numbers, and then prints them out. Okay, so it's, it's a very um, straightforward program, just like the one we had with sum, where we just read some stuff in from standard input, and then we printed that out. So we could compile that if we want to. But before that, let's make a make file because um, it's always a great opportunity to make a make file. And in fact, like I said last previous lecture, I don't remember how to write make files. I mean, I do now because I'm teaching it. But like, I normally don't. So normally I would just be like, oh, I'm going to go find the last make file I've seen and I'll just copy. I didn't make one there. So I literally, like, yeah, this is what I would encourage you to do. I would just go to, um, you go to WebCMS3, you go to a previous lecture. You're like, oh, there was a make file lecture, wasn't there? You click on that one, and then you just go through here until you find, and you're like, oh, this one looks super nice. Now, most make files, again, are pretty simple if you're only dealing with one uh, binary to compile. Um, so if you're only dealing with one binary to compile, then you don't, you don't really like benefit much from a make file. But you can keep it pretty simple. I'll say that, you know, to sort, um, my sort binary will come from sort.c. And the command I'm going to run is GCC with my flags, which is w all and w error, um, dash o sort sort.c. And I don't need anything else. So all those extra lines, remember, are for um, when we have multiple files. A make file with just one binary is really simple. So now I'm going to run make. No targets specified. Mm, what have I done wrong here? Do I have a make file? Ooh, did I put it in the wrong folder? Oh, I got to put it in the sort folder. Okay, so I put it in the wrong folder here. You can see it hanging out here. I can just move that into my sort folder and then go inside my sort folder and now it's there. And when I run make, it says sorts up to date. So basically that's saying I already compiled this when I was preparing the lecture. Um, and, and yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jay's asked a question which I get every single term, which is like, not sure if this has been answered, but why do the slides go up and down, left and right? Uh, yeah, the answer is to organize them better. It, it essentially just means that rather than having to think of the lectures as like this silly linear list, which it can be kind of confusing, that um, I can actually show you here quickly. Like the actual structure of them is just basically uh, just slides, but with subpages. So it's just like all across. Um, and then like some of them, if there's more to talk about, you just go down. Um, yeah, that's it. When when you when we export them as PDFs, they all come out in a line anyway, so it's it's not really any different from like a PDF viewing. Um, plus, they like get labeled. So if you actually look at the PDF, for instance, um, you'll see that the PDFs actually say like uh, one, two. It's hard, really hard to see here, but like down here it says three point one and three point two and all that. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, the slides are 2D array. I think, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kai. You could uh, you could imagine it as a as a, as an array of linked lists, if you will. Um, there was a question here: Should the clean line of sort instead of R RBT? I saw that in the corner of my eye, and someone's absolutely correct. This should say uh, sort, not RBT, because that's actually what it is. So now, when I run make clean, it will actually delete my. Oops, I saved that in the wrong file. Classic mistake. I see students do this every term. I moved my make file, but gedit doesn't care about that. Gedit's still trying to save it to the previous location. So if you ever move your file, delete it, like close it, and then reopen it. So I got to update this to be sort. 
and then we go make clean, which will delete my sort file, and then I do make, which will recompile it. Now, when I run sort, um, I can enter, you know, let's enter five, three, four, two, one, six, nine, eight, and then I press Control D to say that that's the end of the input, and then it sorts my numbers. It just prints them out. How cool is that? So it prints out one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine. So it did sort all my numbers for me. And as you know from the previous lecture as well, we can use um, the pipe symbol to actually send in um, a whole bunch of different different files here. Now, I don't think I, I thought I had a slide on. Oh, yeah, the slides up the top. So um, we have a bunch of files that I've generated here. I've used like an online tool to make all of these numbers. But basically, it is um, files that consist of um, a certain amount of numbers. 100 numbers, 1,000 numbers, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. And then we have all these different files. These files have 100 numbers in sorted order. These files have numbers in reverse sorted order, which means they're in literally the worst order possible. Thank you, sorry. Um, and then we have a bunch of files which are all random. So it's like just totally random numbers um, in no particular order. And we can have a look at those together uh, just pretty easily if I open like say sorted 100 then it's all just sorted numbers and if I open reverse sorted 100 then it's all numbers in reverse order and then if I open random 100 it's all the numbers in a random order and what we're going to do now is we're going to run the uh, time um, time command on all of these and we might actually just like make notes of it too so I'll open this in Excel um, and we can do, what was it? It was 100, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, and 100,000. I might put commas here so they're a bit easier to, to read. Yep. And then we'll do our sorted, reverse sorted, and random. Like that. And let's just keep track of these times. So um, we can run our program and then see how long they all take. So. Um, Firstly, let's run sort with uh, sorted100.txt. Now that was really quick. Um, if I want to actually find the time of that program, I have to put time out the front. Now something that's really subtle here is that when you time a program, um, there's actually the time it takes the computer to print to terminal actually like consumes that time a little bit. So to be super fair, on this program, I'm actually going to essentially write it to a file, which I'll call dud. So remember that when you write a program like this, this means output, take everything that was going to standard output and put it in a file, and this means get the file and put it into what standard input is, essentially. So here, um, I can say dud, and I'm just putting it there, I don't want to look at it, right? I, I, I'm assuming my sorting program works, I just don't want it to um, actually uh, consume the time of the computer, right? Because like this takes time. You can't see it because it's a hundred numbers, but it actually takes like fractions of a second to print it out. And I'm not interested in understanding how long the program takes to print something. I want to know how long it takes to sort it. Because printing to a file is substantially quicker than um, printing to the terminal. Printing still takes time, of course, um, like to a file, but it's a lot more negligible compared to printing to the terminal because when you print it to the terminal, the computer actually has to render it. Like it actually has to display it and like go through some things. Whereas a file, it can just like dump it in there. Um, yeah, exactly. It's like updating the pixels that's taking the time and that slows down the program. I could remove the printf. Um, that's a genius idea, though. Uh, I'm just kind of keeping it here for now for demonstrative purposes. But yes, you could remove it too. It gets really tricky as well because um, I'll just tell you a fun fact. It's like you got to be careful with some compilers because um, <laughs> if you don't print anything um, and you put the optimization flag on, because remember how we talked about how you can have like a big dash O here, which is like um, to optimize it for the compiler to make your program uh, faster. Uh, sometimes these optimization flags will, I've seen this happen before, um, it will literally look at your program realize that it does nothing 
Like realize that you read in numbers, sort them, and then do nothing with it, and it will it will it will optimize your program into nothing. Like it basically just like deletes your program essentially. Like the the executable that it produces does nothing. It just like it's just like runs and finishes because it's like well you aren't doing anything, so like why would I compile anything? I don't remember the circumstances that happened in, and I'm sure it's like not something you need to worry about, but that's why I'm dubious of writing programs that effectively do nothing or have no side effects, you might say. Um, so yeah, uh, Eric, you said, uh, can I slow down a bit? If there's something confusing, just call it out. Um, different people will find different things confusing. So <clears throat> um, I know I talk fast, but I'm actually, I actually go through these concepts extremely, like gr slowly a lot of the time, and it sounds dumb, but I, I try and really drag out the details. Like we're, we're not even talking about the maths of this yet. We're just trying to actually play around with the program. But if something's confusing, please just give me a buzz and we'll help you out. Um, Jay says, will the, will the time actually be measuring the printf time? Uh, yes, it will, but that's negligible in this case. So we're just, we're ignoring that for now. Um, but you could remove it totally, absolutely fine. And then the last one is, um, sorry, another question. Hamish says, won't the output dud redirect to the output of the time command? Um, so Hamish asked a good question, which is that if I run sort with these sorted numbers, it does that. If I run sort with dud or dud.txt, I'll give it a file name. I'll give it a file extension just so you're like, oh, it's a text file. Um, it, it takes longer, apparently. Um, no, so in this case, um, it will actually still display the time because what happens is when a program runs, uh, if this is your running program, it actually does like all the printf's. This is my attempt to write printf. All the printfs go to standard out, and then other things like the time command outputs, they actually go to standard error. So without getting into the, the details of, um, uh, you know, Linux and Unix file systems and stuff, um, essentially there's like two outputs, and um, some of them go to standard error. And when we do this like little redirecty thing here, it goes to, to standard out. Just to be clear too, I know there's some people who like have never seen the redirect before. Um, I, I tell people this all the time. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I really liked the flexibility of a computer science degree, but now that I teach a lot in this school, I don't like it because it essentially means that like everyone does all these courses in really weird orders and then they end up, um, like you end up with like some students being like, oh, I've seen this plenty of times. And some students are like, what, what is that? Um, and I think it creates a weird vibe. So I'm sorry for those who because a bunch of you know what the output redirect is. And I think you said it's, I don't remember where you said it's from. And then a bunch of you are like, I've never seen that before. And I'm like, God, oh, that's annoying for like a, a core course. Um, but yes, yeah, so let's look at the dud.txt file. So I outputted it to this file here. Um, it's just a dump of the file. It's just like, it just gets, it just, it sends, instead of it going to the terminal, it just goes into a file. It's really simple. Um, Yeah, um, I was talking to some people in 151 about this the other day. Um, I won't get into it actually, but um, yeah. Uh, so we have sorted 100. Now that takes, like, let's use the real time. Let's use the user time. So I'm going to say it's 0 0.02 seconds, um, and then I'm going to do sorted 1000 which is going to be 0 0.003, and then I'm going to do sorted 5,000, which is 0 0.005, and then I'll do sorted 10,000, which is zero. <laughs> okay. Should have run it a few times. All right, it's like, it's similar. So I, I definitely should run these a few times. I'm not because this particular use case is always going to be really slow. Um, so this one's like point one, 0.015. Um, and then if we do 100,000 numbers, it's similar, Point, point oh 0.02. Okay, so why are these all so small? That's the interesting question. And the reason for this is because, um, someone will probably tell me, text. Ah.
Okay, no one said anything. So the reason it's so fast is because think back to our um, think back to our algorithm here, which is um, it essentially when it tries to sort numbers, it loops through this list as many it keeps going through and through and through and through until it's sorted. But because it's already sorted, the first time it goes through, it never loops again. So basically, this program goes in sorted as false, while sorted as false, which it is. I'm going to set sorted to true. I'll iterate through all of the numbers, and if any of them are in the wrong order, I'll swap them. But none of them are in the wrong order, so it immediately just leaves. So it enters the while loop once, and then on the second check, it quits. So the program essentially just runs for one loop through the program. It's, it's the equivalent program, effectively, of just having a program that loops through an array once. That's why it's super, super quick. Even for like um, 100,000 numbers, which is a lot of numbers. Now let's look at the case where the numbers are random. So um, in the case where the numbers are random, we'll do random 100. And you can see that random 100 is quite quick as well. It takes like 0 0.003 seconds. Now remember that for these kinds of small timings here, um, there's so much noise and randomness that you know, you shouldn't really think about it too much. Like anything that's like in these categories is just quite fast. Um, and as, as James said in the chat, overhead is inevitable. There's always some kind of overhead with setting up a program or doing something like that. Um, so if you see these numbers be like less than 0.01, you just kind of like, yeah, it's just fast. Um, so Vincent says, so the real time also counts the time taken to print. Um, so the real time is, the real time is not exactly like user plus sys, but yeah, it's it's a bit complicated because like the sys time consists of so like when your when your program says I want to print to a file, it has to knock on the door of the operating system, right, and be like, hey, I want to look at this file. I don't, I can't just look at files on the computer. You need to let me. And the operating system says, ah, okay, I can see that you can open that file. So here's a like a pointer to the file so you can write to it and then the program says thank you and then the program writes to it um, and the sys and user is essentially like how much time did the operating system spend doing stuff and how much time did the program spend doing stuff which is user um, but let's I'm just gonna keep going for now otherwise we'll get caught in a few things but so that took that took 0 0.03 seconds if we do random of 500 it takes also, oop, there's no 500. That's why, see how it says here, it says bash random 500.txt. Basically, when I tried to run my program, this file didn't exist. So this was essentially the time it takes my program to run with no input. Um, so uh, I'm gonna do a thousand next, and we can see that that is 0 0.010, something like that. I'm just again using user time. For the sake of, like, just to be clear, this course is not a course on, me like, looking at real time. These are just demonstrative purposes. That's why I'm not getting too serious about it. Okay, and then we do 5,000, which is 0 0.81, or 0 0.081, sorry. And then we'll do 10,000. So the time it takes to sort, oops, 10,000 numbers is 0 0.324, or 333. It's all roughly fine. We'll do 50,000 numbers. What are we going to get now? Start guessing. I want you to guess in your head. I'm going to guess in three seconds. I, I just, I really, I could probably actually think about it and figure out what it would be, but um, that would be too smart. So that one took about 10 seconds, right? So that one's like 10.000, whatever. I'm just using the decimal so that they all line up. Um, I just ran it a second time to be sure. Nine seconds. That's about 10 seconds. I'll do 9.5 just to be sure. And now I'm doing 100,000 numbers. How long is this one going to take? I think this one will take a little little moment or two. <laughs> um, I don't know. A minute and a half, maybe. Let's see. Let's all, let's all chat. This is why this lecture is great, because we just get to look at terminals, think for a while. But while this is running, I want you to reflect on how crazy this is. Like, think about how, think about how rapidly this has gone from OK to cooked, right? This has gone from... Just 50, you know, 10,000 numbers was like, you know, real quick. And then suddenly it goes up a lot. Okay, so 37.5. 37.5 seconds. Who's, who got the closest? Trent said 35-ish. Great. Excellent. 
Um, so now the last one is let's look at the unsorted numbers. So naturally you can kind of imagine what's happened here is that with the bubble sort, um, the bubble sort's actually having to do some real processing this time because the numbers aren't sorted, which is the exact thing we saw here, right? It's actually just having to do multiple sweeps through it. Um, now with random numbers, there's not going to be a massive correlation between the time they take. Um, how do I, how do I ban users from the chat? <laughs> Um, uh, this is, this is hide user. James is James is floating around. I'll I'll make him in charge of everything. Um, so that was random. Now let's have a look at uh, reverse sorted. So if I go uh, rev sorted a hundred, right? We'll do these ones quickly. A hundred is really quick, like point zero zero one. Um, and then if we do sorted a thousand. Do really quick. E Oops, sorry. Oh, the first one didn't work either. My bad. Sorry, everyone. So reverse sorted a thousand is like point zero one zero, and reverse sorted a hundred is a hundred will be really quick. And then we do five thousand. You can see that that is like about point oh eight seconds. Sure. Um, and then we'll do reverse sorted of ten thousand, and this one was zero point two eight three and then we do reverse sorted of fifty thousand see how long this one takes this one takes six seconds it's really interesting how it's uh s faster seven point oh two four and then we do a hundred thousand give us a sec. So the point of this exercise is because we're about to spend um, the rest of the course essentially um, this is one of the first times that this uh, I've started to make my live streams public by the way so I have a suspicion that maybe it's because of that too I don't know. Um, 28 seconds oh so it seems to be faster that's so strange genuinely um, sure we could think about that a bit but let's come back to the algorithm so the reason that we do this topic is so that you can have a, a bit of a tactile understanding um, of what is actually happening when we talk about algorithm speeds because this is one of the last times in the course that we'll actually spend time um, thinking about how long does it actually take, right? As opposed to like, how long does it theoretically take? That's kind of the, uh, you know, I guess I'll have to make it unlisted now. Not that it'll matter. Um, yeah, so that's it really interesting. Now, what you'll notice about this, does someone want to tell me in what way they think these algorithms grow? Because someone said to me before exponential, which I appreciate that you just say that because, I mean, people like to say that when things go really, really quick, right? Um, but why is it exponential? Or why is it not exponential? Okay, so a bunch of people are talking about um, the uh, people are saying things like quadratic and squared. Um, n squared like these are the things people are saying and that's true because if you actually think about what's happening here um, <clears throat> if you have say seven numbers um, and you want to loop through those with a bubble sort you have to loop through like you have to loop through the whole list when you're doing this for loop here which might be like seven times and then in the worst case you will actually have to do seven sweeps right through the program um, and those seven sweeps through the program so that's seven times seven so in the absolute worst case here you have to do seven whole sweeps and each sweep you have to um, go through each number now there's all those other things that take time um, such as like you know we have to actually swap those numbers and things like that but we're about to get back to like 
um, you know, what actually takes up that time. Now, I know everyone's going crazy in the chat, um, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to be glancing at it slightly less, otherwise I find it a bit distracting. Um, someone's asked about the difference between user time and sys time. I've actually explained that in this lecture and the last lecture, so I'd say just go back and watch this one again or watch the last lecture again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quadratic, right? So what that means is that if we were to try and plot something like this and we had a lot more data types, right? We had um, no, like inputs, we had like 500, 2000, 3000, 4000, 6000. If you did something like that, then you would probably see that the program actually goes quadratically. So, I mean, we all remember hopefully what a quadratic graph looks like because we, we all went to high school. Um, it would look something like this. So, you know, as the, as the input grows like this, the amount of time the program would take would go up quadratically, right? Um, so, this kind, of, uh, this kind of understanding is very theoretical, what we just talked about with, you know, graphs. Um, and what we looked at with Excel and here is a lot more hands-on. But there's a lot of problems with this, which we're about to, uh, which we're about to hopefully dive into. So um, we've just kind of discussed this about programs, but here's the problem with literal program runtime analysis. The problem with it is that when we use something like the time command, um, or we want to figure out how much memory it's using by looking at RAM, uh, firstly, it requires us to implement the algorithm. That's number one. So like if we try and implement the algorithm, then that's going to take time. So quite often we actually do this kind of complexity analysis on programs when we're trying to decide whether or not we want to write them. You know, we're like, is this bubble sort quick enough? That's the question you'll ask before you write it. You don't want to do it if it's not quick enough. So that's one thing we don't like about having to literally run the programs. You have to finish it to figure out whether you should have finished it, which is a bit backwards. Um, the other problem is that runtime is influenced by a specific machine. So it's really hard to tell how fast an algorithm is because, you know, this is VLAB. My computer might do it quicker, might do it slower. Probably quicker because VLAB is a little slow. Um, and then it changes like on a per machine basis and different machines will have different disk write times and they'll have different that. And like it just, it's so different depending on the CPU, right? Um, so... And that leads to a situation where to, to effectively compare algorithms or to effectively understand algorithms, you need to use the same machine and the same circumstances to compare it. And that's just kind of crazy. It makes it really hard to ask ourselves, you know, is this type of sort better than this type of sort? Is this type of this better than this type of this? We can't really do that. So what we need is we need a way of being able to theoretically analyze algorithms without having to write C, without having to do any of that, um, but just generalize them so that I can just say to you, oh, let's just have a look at a bubble sort and decide how fast we think it is. And that's what this entire analysis of algorithms um, performance analysis topic is about. Before we get into that, into the like mathy side of it, um, we first need to understand pseudocode. Now, pseudocode is a term that you've probably heard before somewhere. Your tutor might have mentioned it. It might have been mentioned by another tutor in another course. But essentially, pseudocode is uh, kind of like a, a, a fake language that doesn't really have a clear syntax that we can write in to describe a program without actually having to implement it or worry about what machine it's run on. So it's, it's like an easy way to write a program without actually having to write anything. Now, pseudocode is more structured than English in terms of like, if you were to try and write your algorithm as an essay, um, pseudocode would look like programming language. A programming language and if you were to compare your pseudocode to a C file it would kind of look like um, you know not quite proper code yeah and I know there's a bunch of people who've done software design and development in high school who are having triggers at the moment but that's okay we'll, we'll get through that together we'll support each other um, uh, will your final exam involve pseudocode I don't know I'm so far from that point of the term so I just want to give you some examples of pseudocode. So on the left here, we have our sum, sum algorithm that we wrote earlier. This is from um, the first part of this lecture. On the right is what you would, uh, how you would write it as pseudocode. Okay. Now what you notice here is that pseudocode is not so much concerned with types. It's not so much concerned with syntax. It's just concerned with describing the logical flow and functionality um, of the the program. Now, uh, Ricardo says it's basically Python. So 
Um, it, 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 yes, a lot of it will kind of look and feel like a dumber version of Python, um, a lot more so than C. So the way you write pseudocode, just to be clear, is that there's, there's no hard syntax that we're enforcing in this course. Um, I read through some of the, my experience feedback and I noticed that people were kind of complaining about that um, because they're like, oh, you know, damn. Um, it was really annoying having like a strict guide. But the, the way that I'm kind of telling everyone to write it is that I don't really care how you write it as long as it makes sense. I don't really care what you do. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example here. Um, if we take this, let's make VLAB bigger again. Some people might write the program like this. God damn it, copy. Why is that not copying? Copy. Copy. Ah, I give up. Let me, maybe I can copy this. Okay. So some people might write a program like that. Okay. Um, whereas other people might come along and not having done that, might, they might just say, oh, I have a function called sum numbers um, that takes in no arguments and uh, it's going to um, set the sum to be zero. And we'll say, like, while, um, you know, scanf from stood in as variable i, or like you say, while i equals scanf from stood in, then we want a sum plus equals i, and then um, they might write it Python-like with colons, and then they'll just say print sum. Um, and the, oh, thank you for the, the typo. So the point I'm kind of trying to make here at the start is that there's no strict syntax for pseudocode. Um, I mean, that you, we could enforce one, but I don't, I think it defeats the spirit of it because the point of pseudocode is for you to not be bounded by syntax and for you to be able to try and um, uh, describe your thoughts and logic in a consistent way, but not necessarily a, a you know, syntactical way. So if someone, if someone, if we ask this in an exam, for instance, to write a, a, a pseudocode for a function that sums up numbers from standard input, both of these would be fine because they both make sense. Right? They both make sense. They're basically saying, yep, we have a variable, we're looping through input, we're in adding that input onto the sum, and then we're printing it at the end, right? So both of those are totally fine, and that's, that's, that's really it. So it's a way that we can quickly write um, a program without actually having to implement it. Now, I know some of you have said, like, oh, I just like writing it in C, but um, that's because you're looking at really simple programs, and it's because you think... <laughs> You probably have this idea in your head like, oh, I'll just deal with a problem and I'll just write it in code. But I can guarantee you that there are going to be a bunch of problems in this course you come across where you think, I have no idea how to code that yet because you haven't before and you're just not smart enough, like 99% of you, including me. And you're going to want to try and write it down. It's kind of like a draft. It's like writing dot points before you write an essay. It's a way of... Um, you know, creating that middle step between an idea in your head and physical code. And we're also going to use it to try and understand algorithms later. I don't know why this slide is repeated twice here. Here's another slide. This one is for the sorting algorithm. Now, I've written this one in like a Python style pseudocode just to kind of show you that you can do it different ways. This one's written a little bit more like a programming language. The one I wrote up above here kind of has a bit uh, oh, these, sorry, these are two different pseudocode examples. So I've just written the sum pseudocode differently here. Um, but, you know, some of these are a little bit loose. This one is written nearly literally like Python. Um, and for those of you who've done like a Python course or some kind of high-level scripting language, if you, don't, um, if you don't feel comfortable thinking about what pseudocode is, you can honestly just write Python without the harder bits. So take a good look at this um, thing that's written here. This is a sort function that takes in a list of numbers, right? We don't need to worry about, is it a pointer to a, an array and we have to pass in the size? It's like, no, it's just a list of numbers. And then we do the standard things. We set sorted to false. We loop while it's not sorted. We set sorted to true. We loop through all the elements. You notice here as well how we're not being concerned with fence post errors here. See how for a normal bubble sort, sorry, this is, a, this is the slides messing something up. You know, for a normal bubble sort, we only want to sort from like size minus one. I kind of glossed over that because we'll do it later in the course. Um, we don't need to get concerned with that for pseudocode. We can just write for loop because 
let the developer worry about the bounds and stuff. We're just trying to describe the general logic, which is that we go through everything in the list. And then we say, you know what, if the list items are the wrong way around, you could literally write this as like, you know, if the left is bigger, you know, if, if an item is bigger than the one immediately to the right, like you could literally write that in text if you think it explains your situation better. And then we just say swap because we want to swap them. So going to swap those two numbers. Um, done and dusted. There's my pseudocode. This is really helpful because if someone hasn't written a bubble sort before, this is going to make a lot of sense to them. And like, I know it might not seem like that because you all feel like hardcore programmers, but um, something like this does make a lot more sense if you haven't seen it before. That's also why when you go to Google and you type in something like bubble sort and you go to like the Wikipedia page, it gives you this funny diagram, which I still think is the funniest thing because it actually makes perfect sense once you understand what it's saying. But uh, it's kind of like, oh, this is a bubble sort. I got it. I got it. I was missing the blue line before. It's like, all right. Um, <laughs> it's just so funny to me. Um, you know, but if you, are, if you go down, it'll actually give you this pseudocode implementation. So this one is a little bit more, um, this, it's not really that different, right? It's probably slightly more. It kind of nearly looks like VBA or something. Um, but... Yeah, that's that's how they describe it on Wikipedia because like they're not going to give you the C program for it. Like why would they give you the C program instead of the Java program or the this program? They're trying to give you the general understanding of the algorithm without getting too caught up in the in the actual programs itself, right? Um, yeah. So can we use math? So Morgan asks a good question. Can we use mathy notation like? Uh, X in all list and stuff, or I mean, I'll, I'll just see if there's any on the page. Oh, that's pretty. Look at that one. Ooh, ooh, isn't that satisfying? Isn't that satisfying? Um, so this is what a random set of numbers looks like, by the way. This is this is what a this is like what a computer sorting it looks like. We're going to talk a lot more about this later in the course, so we're not going to spend time doing it now. But yes, you can use um you can use math symbols if you want. That's totally fine. Like you can use the like the for all and the all in each or like something like that. Generally, I wouldn't um I wouldn't go crazy with it, but you can definitely you can definitely use it. it it's really about whatever you like. It's a communication tool. Like you're writing pseudocode often for other people. Um, you're reading pseudocode often for yourself. So if you're writing pseudocode, ask yourself like you know. Is this going to help someone understand it? Because you're often trying to simple, like strip away the complexity, so that other people can easily absorb what you're trying to say. Uh, what you're trying to say. So, yep. Um, back to the slides. So th that's kind of how we write pseudocode. Now we're gonna. The reason we w care about that is because now we're going to get into the kind of crux of this lecture, which we might do after the break because it's close to three o'clock. Yeah, let's do that. So let's take a five minute break now and we'll start back up at three o'clock um, in about seven or so minutes. So, yep. Um, thank you. And we'll chat in a sec. <laughs> Hi, welcome back from the break. Um, we're going to be looking at theoretical performance analysis. Now, theoretical performance analysis is where we look at pseudocode to try and evaluate how complex a program is. So instead of using the time command, which we've said is painful because you have to write the program and it's hard to actually compare, we're just going to look at pseudocoded programs to understand how long it actually takes to run. A part of this is that we're going to be looking at what we call the time complexity of a program, which is basically we're trying to figure out how long does this program take to run? And we're going to call that time complexity. So we said in the previous little bit that we looked at a program and we said it was quadratic. And okay, so that's like time complexity. That's it's a has a quadratic time complexity, which is a concept we'll come back to. And we measure, um, you know, how uh, we measure how long we think a program takes by counting all the operations that we think have to happen, right? Um, and then we express the complexity of the program based on the variable n, where n is the number of the input. Now, if that doesn't make sense that right now, that's okay. So, to analyze a program, we write it in we write it in pseudocode, um, and then what we do is line by line we go through and we analyze it, and we try and generally speaking we try and count each line independently, um, as if it takes like one unit of time to process. 
Um, and things get complicated once we get into loops, which we'll talk about in a sec. And um, then at the bottom here, we've got a note about best case and worst case analysis, which we will get to as well. But hopefully you have a bit of an intuitive understanding of that because of, um, uh, because of what we did looking at like that sorting algorithm and stuff, right? Remember how we had a look at our... Uh... Sorry, I was trying to light a candle. Okay, so... Seriously, don't, don't be stupid. So, here is a really simple program. <laughs> Someone's going to take a screenshot of there being smoke coming off the camera and be like, be like, oh, Hayden's smoking weed on the internet. Um, no, I'm just I'm far less intelligent than that. So, this is our sorting algorithm, right? We had a look at our bubble sort before. Um, where we had uh, a list that was taken in and it was sorted and we've been through this algorithm before. But what I really want to take you through here is um, to try and analyze how long this program takes to run, okay? So if you have a look here, what I've actually done is we've analyzed this line by line and I've broken this up into two columns, right? Oh, so if you have a look here, um, I ask you that question again, how many operations does this program take or this function take to execute? Now, when we do this, we generally write things as either ones or ends a lot of the time, um, or like numbers or n. And the reason is because pretty much the entire equation that we use to calculate time complexity is based off a certain number of inputs. So all of this time complexity analysis we're doing, we don't really just tend to do it on like every program. We tend to do it on, um, programs that have like variable input, right? So sorting algorithms, searching algorithms, addition algorithms, whatever, things that have like n numbers inputted into them. So sorting is a great example because you might sort 10 numbers, 100 numbers, 1000 numbers, a billion numbers, like whatever. Uh, and you can see here what I've actually done is I've said how long, like how many operations does each line take to execute, right? That's the question. Um, and this first line here, sorted equals false. Well, that's one operation. It's just an assignment. So I put a one next to it. The next line, whilst not sorted. So generally when you're actually trying to analyze a program, what you do is you, you often think about the worst case or the average case, but sometimes the worst case is a little bit easier to think about. So let's just think about, um, oh, this one is the best case, sorry. We'll do the worst case one next. Um, though I think there's a typo there. I've got these the wrong way around. Um, sorry. So, my bad. Two seconds. Let's let's fix this one up. Sorry about that. So what I've what I've done wrong here is that I've got uh, these two things are the wrong wrong way around. So this one should be uh, this one's best case here, and the previous one's worst case. I was like, I'm pretty sure we're meant to do the worst case one first. So. That's what we're actually going to do here. So we're going to be looking at this worst case one first, um, which is essentially like if the numbers are all reverse sorted. So in that case, the first line here is one operation. The second line here, this while not sorted is n operations because you could imagine that we're going to go through this while loop n times, right? Because, um, uh, well, that makes sense, right? Like if, if we're going to have to like keep going through it and like reverse sort it the entire time, then we're going to end up in that while loop n times. Because for seven numbers, we're going to end up there seven times. For 10 numbers, 10 times. I'm just going to go back to this page and refresh it. Um, for the next line here, sorted equals true. Well, that's only one operation, right? We only have to do that once. Um, that's one single operation. But you notice here, because it's in a while loop, I've kind of indented it here. I've kind of indented it and put a little asterisk here. We'll come back to like what that means. For the next line here, it's for all elements in the list. Okay, well, if we're going to try and loop through all the elements in the list, that's another n. So I put an n here because this line will end up being um, executed n times. And again, it's got that little star in front of it because it is um, being multiplied. It's like inside a loop. The next one here is I have this comparison here. If list is greater than list of i plus one, is this how many operations is this? One, two, three, four. Well, again, generally you can assume most of the time for simple operations that it's a single operation. That's kind of the advice we give. So in this case here, you say if list is greater than that, 
and I say this is one operation, this is going to be executed once, and again I indent it because um, it's inside this for loop. So anytime something's in a loop, we kind of indent our time complexities as well, just for looping. And then if it's this, we, uh, we swap it. So again, I times this one by one. Notice again that I'm not indenting this because of the if statement. It's only the loops that we indent stuff in. And then the last line here, return list, we assume that that is also just one operation. Um, Jay says, could you explain the bit a bit more while the while loop is n? The while loop here is n because we know we're going to go through it n times in the worst case. So we've seen the, al the bubble sort algorithm work where for reverse sorted numbers, um, you have to sweep through it seven times. For like a list of seven numbers, you have to sweep through it seven times. Because if we go back to the bubble sort algorithm, um, this, the sweep is defined as these red pairs moving from one end to the other. So remember that every time it takes a step, that is this for loop, and every time it goes back to the start, it's the while loop. So for completely unsorted numbers, for totally reverse sorted numbers, we're going to have to essentially like restart seven times for seven numbers. And for eight numbers, we'll have to restart eight times. Um, you can also easily like uh, figure that out just by um, like doing it yourself, like get a bunch of reverse sorted numbers and just like, you know, actually do the algorithm yourself. So that's why it's n, because we're going to have to actually restart that while loop n, n times. Remember, n is the size of input. So n is like the number of items in the list, essentially. Um, Jay says, so no matter how the order of n numbers, if we run the loop n times, it will certainly be in the right order. Correct. Sometimes you need to run it less than n times, but what we're looking at is the worst case. R wrong slide. We're looking at here the worst case. So we're looking at the case where all the numbers are in the complete reverse sorted order, which is the time you have to do the most operations. Yeah, that's why n would be worst case. If it was the best case, it would be 1, which we'll get to in a sec. And if it's like an average case, like that list we saw before, it's kind of like you know, um, two or three or four, like it's somewhere in the middle. Um, ZG says we can use n for both loops. Well, kind of, because you're asking yourself how many times will this loop be executed in the context of things. Now, I want to be really clear, this is not the formal way to figure out time complexity. Your tutors will probably have exciting, possibly better ways of trying to analyze a program like this. I basically just wrote down the way I would think about it if I was trying to explain it to someone, right? Um, so don't take this as gospel. There are other ways to try and look at it as well. Now, the reason I kind of have these two columns here is because essentially, um, once you go inside a loop, you have to think about how many times something's actually executed. So remember how we said like this sorted equals true is a really simple operation. It's just one operation, right? You just sorted equals true, one thing. However, because it's happening inside the while loop, it actually ends up happening n times which is kind of why I've got these little stars here. So this, this, this side column here is actually kind of what represents how many times that line of code is actually executed. So sorted equals false is executed once. While sorted, while not sorted, is executed n times, right? Because we're going to sweep it n times. Sorted equals true is also going to be executed n times because it's inside the while loop. So even though the actual line itself is just a simple operation, um, we're going to end up actually going through that loop seven times or n times, whatever, and therefore it's actually n times one, right? Because this will happen, this is a single operation that happens n times. Similarly, how many times do we uh, operate on this for loop, right? Well, this for loop, because we're looping through all the elements, is going to be n operations. It's going to be n steps of work to do. So that's why it's n, but it also happens inside the while loop. And because it happens inside the while loop, that means we're going to go through n items n times. It's like it's like going through a 2D array, right? Like if you have if you have a whole bunch of items like here, and you go through like all four of them, it's basically the same thing. It's like, you know, if I want to go through all of these, I got to go through this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and then I got to start again. This one and this one and this one and this one, this one and this one, this one, this one. It's essentially an n like it's n times n. It's four times four. Um, There could be there could be an error in here too, so don't don't stress if some of this is wrong. Um, but then we look at these other lines here, right? So comparing with an if statement is just one step as well. However, that step happens inside a for loop, which happens inside a while loop. So we actually have like we have to do n goes through the for loop, and then we have to go uh, do n goes through the sorry, we have to do n goes through the while loop, 
and then n goes through the for loop, and then the actual line itself here is just one operation. And then this line here is the same thing, it's just one operation, n times n times one. So this one here is just for the swap, this n here is because we're going to do it n times because it's in a for loop, and then this n here is because we're going to do it another n times because it's in a while loop. And effectively what that means is that this line here will be done n squared times, this line here will be done n squared times, this line here will be done n squared times, and this line here will be done n times. So, um, yeah, it's alright. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a little, let's, we'll figure it out if there's a slight problem. So what I did then was we sum up all of these, right? So if you want to figure out how long a program takes, go and sum up all these t um, little bits of complexity, right? So like 1 plus n, um, plus n times 1, plus n times n. And when you write it all down, you should get, oh yeah, it should be, I see why you're all confused. Oh, yep. I think I, I think I changed this slightly. It's good that you're also engaged. I get really excited when um, people are really thoughtful. Thank you. That should be it. Sweet. Um, so, Yep, so in this case, what we do is we sum them all up now, right? Like, if we want to figure out how long a program takes, let's add up all the steps, right? Because the computer has to go and do all of these things. So we've got, like, 1 and n and all this, and we get this 1 plus n plus n plus n squared plus n squared plus n squared, which is 3n squared plus 2n plus 2. So we could say, theoretically, just to keep it simple, the time complexity of this program is 3n squared plus 2n plus 2. That's how many steps it takes where n is the input, right? Um, like n is the number of inputs. Now, the line underneath that I have here is called space complexity. Now, space complexity is something that we don't talk about much in the early stages of the course because of the nature of the topics, but we will talk about more later. I just want to flag now that it's a thing. And space complexity is effectively like how much memory does this program use? How much like, how many bytes does it need to actually run? Um, and a, and a sort like this is actually really simple because it doesn't actually really do anything. Like it, yeah, it's got a Boolean variable, sure, but that's it. So, some sorts, do you remember like the sort I mentioned earlier with the kid? Remember how I said if there's a kid and they've got like, you know, all these numbers and they want to sort them, they have to like, they like drag them down like this. To do something like that, you're going to need an array and that's going to take up memory. So some programs actually use memory. They, they create arrays as part of the algorithm. Bubble sort doesn't, so that's why it has a space complexity of one, because it just uses one amount of memory. You notice as well that this one amount of memory doesn't depend on n. And what that means is that if bubble sort sorting 10 numbers, or sorting 100 numbers, or sorting a million numbers, it doesn't actually need any more memory to run. Um, whereas if you look at the time it takes, it actually needs more time. So you know 100 numbers is going to be 3 times 100 squared plus 2 times 100 plus 2, uh, etc. If we have a look at the best case example of bubble sort, um, which is where all of the numbers are in sorted order, right, they're like totally sorted, um, then things are slightly different here as well. So in this, in this case, the algorithm's the same, but what we're assuming is that um, because the numbers are sorted, we only really have to do a sweep once. which I actually think I've done this one wrong. I'm actually really sorry. I'm just looking at this now. Again, these are all these are all new slides that I've made. Yep. Okay. I think this is it. I'll explain to you in a sec what I've done wrong here. Um because it's quite interesting. And this is 3 n plus 1, 2, 3, 4. I think it's just n plus 4. Anyway, let's just look at this slide. I won't, I won't refresh it because we'll keep it really simple. And I'll actually show you what I did wrong here. Um, so when we think about sorted numbers, right, like what do we know about the bubble sort algorithm? We know that it does a series of sweeps. And each sweep it does, it looks at all the pairs. And it keeps doing those sweeps until it goes through all the pairs and it notices that they're all okay, right? Um, now, in this particular algorithm, sorted equals false is one operation, done. 
Then we check while things are not sorted. We loop while things are not sorted. But we know in the best case that a bubble sort only does one sweep because they're already sorted. So we're actually only going to execute this while loop once, right? On the next line here, we do sorted equals true, right? Because that's in the while loop, we need to, you know, times that by one. So that's one times one because this is a single operation that happens once in the while loop. Um, and then the next line here, the for loop, even for a sorted list, we still actually have to do that for loop of looking at all the pairs, right? So we go pair, 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 pair. So that's still n. So that still takes n operations. So that's n operations that are done once because we only sweep once, but we still need to look through n items. So that's one times n here. Then the next line here, we don't enter this if statement. We don't do this swap. So they're not operations we need to worry about. So this is one times n times zero. Um, and then the last line is a return. And when you add those all up, you get one times one times one plus n because these two lines are zero. So you get n plus four, which is n plus four. So the time it takes this program in theoretically is what we would say n plus four. So instead of three n squared or something, it's just n plus four. Um, now what I did before when I was writing these slides, because I knew it was an n something algorithm, I, I confused myself because I, uh, in my brashness, I thought we did this one n times, but this one once, which makes no sense, right? So that was just a silly mistake on my part. So this is actually what's executed n times, it's just we only sweep once. I kind of got those back to front when I wrote the slides. Um, now people are asking some really great questions in the chat that I'm about to clear up in a very indirect way. Um, lastly, this program is also a, a space complexity of one as well, because we don't really allocate memory. Um, and then if we also look at our sum program from before, it's like, okay, well, summing is one operation, reading input from standard in as n operation, summing them as one operation. This line is one operation, but it happens inside a while loop. So that's n times one. And then we print it, which is one. So this program here is two n plus two, right? We like sum those up again. Um, so this one is, and, and similarly, we don't really use any memory for this program. Okay, so people are asking all these really interesting questions about, you know, how long does it take to do a comparison and operator? Um, it depends on the processor clock and efficiency, uh, blah, blah, blah. Lots of really interesting things. People are like, oh, shouldn't we count the if statement here? Like, isn't this an operation? And some people are saying, no, it's not because it's false. And some people are saying, yes, it is, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, what, I'm, what I want to demonstrate to you in a sec is why it doesn't matter. Why, why um, one of you is technically right, but it doesn't really matter that either of you might be right. So when we've been analyzing these programs, we've been assuming that a lot of things are what we call like primitive operations, right? Which just take a step for a processor, what we call constant time. So a constant time operation is something that's like always just takes the same amount of time regardless of how big the input is. And one of the most basic examples of that is that when you ask a computer to sum up one and one, or you ask it to sum up this number and this number, your processor actually does that in the same amount of time, right? It, whether it's a number one or it's a big number, regardless of the size of the input, the processor will still take, you know, exactly 30 nanoseconds to do that or whatever the hell it takes. I have no idea. Um, and that's why we call it constant time. It's not because it takes one second. It's because the time it takes is not a factor of the input size. doesn't matter if the input's tiny, big, whatever. It's always the same amount of time. So that's why we have these operations here as one. Because you know what? Setting a variable to be zero on a computer probably takes a couple of steps. Like you guys have done 1521. You know, a lot of you would know what it's like. You know, you've got registers and you've got to do this and do that. And you know that multiplying or adding like this is like multiple steps, but it's like we generally assume that these are all what we call primitive operations, which are just like one step of processing. We do that for like comparisons and like variable assignments and like indexing of an array and all this kind of stuff. Um, if you haven't done 1521, I'm just talking about assembly. Like if anyone's ever seen assembly, um, ooh. You know, just like assembly code where you're basically giving the CPU direct instructions and stuff. Um, it's essentially the point is that even a simple one plus one in C is actually often can be multiple steps on the actual computer, but we're just assuming that it's one for simplicity. Oh, okay. So while it says if it's just one step, why is the if statement comparison not zero but one? That's a great question. We're nearly there. 
sorry. So I just got to primitive operations. We just talked about that. Now we're going to talk about big O notation. So, so far I've been saying things to you like, oh, the time complexity of this program is 3n squared or something like that. But that's not really what we think about as time complexity. That's just like what I gave you as like a, a really simple understanding of it. In reality, when we want to analyze a program's time complexity, we always give it in this, what we call big O notation. And big O notation is essentially a simplified version of the time complexity that we might come up with while we're doing like these little operations. So for instance, like when we were analyzing our worst case bubble sort, we came up with 3n squared plus 2n plus 3, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, but when we do our bigger notation, we want to come up with something even simpler. And I'll give you the really simple rule, which is that what you do to get your bigger number, which is your actual time complexity, is you take your kind of raw number, your 3n squared plus 2n plus 3, like whatever you calculated by doing something like this, and you remove any constant factors from the front of variables. So what that means is that we get rid of these, uh, I'll just pull this up into something else. We get rid of um, we get rid of all these like constant factors in front of all of our n's like that. So anytime you've got like an n here or some other uh, variable, you just get rid of the numbers out the front. And then you also right remove any lower order variables. So what that means is that in any kind of polynomial, right? So again, I'm testing your high school maths here. You might have something like n cubed plus n squared plus 4 or n squared plus n plus 2 or n plus 4 or like n to the power of 4, like whatever, right? If you, you know, polynomials, they're always these like, uh, you know, series of powers and stuff. I, uh, you know, things like this, right? You've got your 3a cubed plus 3a squared plus whatever. And what you do then is you don't only remove the constant factors outside of it, but you remove everything in this case that's less than n squared. So because n squared is our highest order part of the polynomial, we get rid of the n and the constant factor. And if we had a, uh, if we had a, a time complexity that was like n cubed plus n plus 5, we would get rid of n and 5. So you only keep the, uh, the biggest factor here, right? You don't worry about the smaller ones. So they're the two things you do to kind of convert a raw time complexity into a big O notation, which is your kind of actual time complexity that you'd like share with someone. Um, just reading the chat, basically. Now, so this, this kind of makes it simpler because what it means is that when we go back to our worst case bubble sort here, we can actually say that the real, like the, the big O notation time complexity of this program is O of N squared. So essentially once you simplify it, you just put it in brackets and you put an O out the front and we call that big O notation, right? Um, and when we look at our best case program, which was 3n plus 2, we do the same thing here. We strip away the constant factors in front of things, and then we remove all of the lower order stuff, so we end up with O of n for 3n plus 2. So the kind of basic steps you might follow is like, figure out the general complexity of a program, then write it in big O notation, and that's your time complexity. And this is how we can compare algorithms. So what we can start to say now is that our bubble sort has a best case time complexity of O n squared and it has a wor uh, oops, oops, oops. It has a worst case time complexity of O n. Okay, so now I'm going to jump back to the questions that I'm being asked and I have been asked, which is people kind of saying like, um, why the comparison isn't treated as one instead of zero. So here's, here's the reason. Um, I didn't actually know what big O stands for, probably, biggest order. Should have Googled that. Um, but yeah, J, the leading term without the leading coefficient. Yep, that's the other way to think about it. There's tons of ways to think about this, and I really would encourage you to, to really take take lead from your tutor as well, because, um, again, they they will have probably some better ways of explaining this stuff. So to go back to um, Waleed's question, which is around this. So remember when I wrote this, we wrote this as um, for the best case, this if statement we wrote down as zero because we were like, oh, well, it's not true. So we wrote it as zero. Now, 
that's kind of just dumb. That's kind of like not true, right? Because whether an if statement is true or false, it takes the same amount of time. Like, it's not quicker if it's true. I mean, sometimes, let's not get into that. But like, it's basically always the same time. So just because we don't enter this, it doesn't mean it doesn't operate. So this should really be one, right? But the nature of big O notation um, is such that even if this was one, what would happen? This would now be one. So this would be n. So we would have ended up with 4n plus 2, right? So it would have been 4n plus 2 instead of like 3n plus 2. But when we convert that into like big O notation where we just keep the leading term without the coefficient, it's still n. So it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we get some of these things wrong. So you'll start to understand this as you do more of these is that it's really all about getting the big things right. Because you know what swap might be like, um, might take four operations. Right, like we saw that swap algorithm from earlier, right? Uh, where is it? Here, like we wrote a swap piece of code and it was three lines of code. So why is that not three? Like, why did I not write this one here as three? Because it is three technically, right? Like it's three lines of C, that's probably what it is, but it doesn't really matter because it's like all constant time and pretty much all constant time coefficients kind of get removed later. So so the, the kind of general rule with all this stuff is just, um, the primitive operations you have a little bit of wiggle room in. You can kind of get them wrong, you can miss stuff, you can like, you can forget the return. Anything that like is quite small and simple, uh, you can disregard. And generally speaking, you, you just have to be a bit more cautious the deeper you get into loops as well, because like, this is where all the complexity is in the algorithm, essentially. Um, Camille says, uh, so Big O basically considers the number of loops. So yeah, it's, what it says is that, um, the highest order polynomial will completely destroy all the other parts of the equation. And it doesn't matter whether it's like 2n squared or 3n squared, and we're about to actually talk about that as well. Um, and while he, I see, so technically a constant time non-zero, but to us it's irrelevant since big O only looks at the biggest order. Yeah, exactly. So like, we're not really focused on the noise of this, we're focused on like what has the biggest impact, which I'm going to talk about here. So, um, here are some simple things. Your general complexity is on the left here, n squared 3n, 3n plus 3, 2n squared plus whatever, and your big O value is on the right. So um, some of these will be a bit confusing, particularly the log n stuff, because you're probably like, oh, what the hell is that? Um, we're going to be talking a lot about that a lot more um, uh, next week in particular when it comes to trees. Um, and then n log n stuff we'll continue to talk about. So don't worry about the log n stuff yet. Um, Actually, we might talk about it. I wanted to talk about it today, but I'm worried about timing. Um, so don't talk about the log n stuff. Don't worry about the log n stuff yet, but just like pay attention to how, and I'm sorry that I just randomly like omitted O's from the rest of these again. This is what happens, new slides. There's always little typos. Um, so you should all have O's out the front of them. But essentially you notice how we're removing the non-dominant factors. And I think the other important thing to note here is that um, whenever you multiply to end things together, we don't get rid of one of them. So I really want you to pay attention here to this like uh, 3n times log n and this n plus log n. Um, and you notice how in the n plus log n case, we get rid of the log n because log n is definitely smaller um, than n, right? But in this case up here where we have 3n times log n, we actually keep the n times log n. So if you kind of have, uh, you know, these incompatible um, things like n and log n together, you don't really just like get rid of log n because that's a multiplying thing. But again, this will all start to like get absorbed into your head generally. Um, so, whoops. So yeah, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Now, again, this is a really critical lecture in the course. It's a really critical, to it's a really critical topic in the course, but we don't expect you to get it all straight away, right? This is essentially like, this is everything we're gonna teach you in the course, even though right now a lot of it might not make complete sense. And we're gonna keep coming back to this, right? So as we go through the course, it's not gonna be like, oh, here is like the more advanced version of this. We've kind of actually showed you all there is about time complexity theoretically. We just haven't given you a lot of um, the, the tools you need yet to actually like look at different examples. And that's what we're going to keep doing. So generally speaking, when you 
when you write your program's time complexity with big O notation, it's going to be either a product or a singleton of all of these types, constant time, log n, n, n log n, n squared, n cubed, or two, two to the power of n, not two n. Uh, something got stripped away there on the export. So that's two to the power of n. Um, and we will keep talking about these things. Now we've kind of touched on this, um, but we're going to dive into it a little more now, which is uh, n, n, n factorial should also be there. Yeah, sure. Um, that could be there too. There's probably some others that could be there as well, like n to the power of n, which is a brutalizing algorithm, um, or Graham's number n or something, if anyone's seen those YouTube videos about Graham. I would actually strongly encourage everyone to... Genuinely, I don't like watching YouTube much, but there's a beautiful video by someone that I can't remember now. I don't remember who made it. Oh, this guy. Yeah, Day 9 TV. It's one of my favorite math videos, and I don't even like math videos, so um, I'm sure there's some other funny ones. But yeah, check this one out. It's super funny, um, if you like math. <laughs> so, uh, why do we remove things? Why do we turn... 2n squared plus 4n minus 5 into on squared. Like, why do we do that? And the simple reason is because they become irrelevant at scale, right? And I think uh, James has said something to this uh, comment earlier where he said, Big O is about looking at the dominant behavior of your algorithm. So essentially, like, as your program scales, which part of the algorithm is going to consume more and more time proportionally? Right? And the, the reason I, I mentioned at the start of this course that this course is really about understanding programming at scale. And the reason for that is because why we look at these big O notations is because it doesn't matter if your bubble sort is n or n squared or n log n or log n or whatever, if you're only dealing with like 100 numbers. Every program is super quick for 100 numbers. A thousand numbers, like most ten thousand numbers, programs become really interesting when you look at dealing with like a million, a billion, a trillion numbers, or trying to do a billion number calculation, a billion number algorithm every second, or stuff like that, right? So it's all about trying to understand how these programs operate as um, as our numbers become, as our inputs become huge, because as our inputs become huge, there are some parts of the program that don't take any longer to run and there are some parts of the program that take a lot longer to run and that's where our focus needs to be. I made this little table for you um, which I thought was kind of interesting and what I wanted to show you is that if we have a program like 2n squared plus a thousand with a big O notation of n squared let's have a look at how these these uh, programs how long they take um, in terms of operations and in terms of actual physical time. Um, uh, so, yes, n squared. So what I've got here is this is what like, this is what just a normal n squared algorithm looks like. This one here is two n squared and then this one here is two n squared plus a thousand. Now here's the thing I want you to notice. If we're doing 10 inputs, right? then um, 100, like 10 inputs for an n squared program takes 100 cycles, right? 10 inputs for a 2n squared plus 1000 program takes 20 times more time. But it's, they're all still ridiculously fast because the numbers are small, right? Like for 100, for 10 inputs, 100, 2000. I, I think I remember when I did programming challenges, I think the general rule we had was that a computer can do roughly 200 million primitive operations a second. Um, which is kind of what I base this off. Um, shouldn't that be two, 1200? No, I think it's 2000s, okay. Um, so yeah, so you have n, n squared, two n squared, two n squared plus a thousand. Now what you notice here is that as this program goes from 10 to 100 to 1000 to 10,000 to 100,000 to a million, um, have a notice how quickly this thousand component disappears, right? Like. First it's here, then it's here, then it's here, then it's here. And like suddenly, from this first line here for 10 inputs, where it was half of what the time took, right? Half of that time was just doing that constant factor cost. Then when we have a million inputs, it's literally irrelevant. It's literally like 0 
it's like I could figure that out like what is that let's I'm gonna do this wrong but it's like one divided by 200 yeah it's like point zero 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 five percent of all the time that it took right um, oh I see what you're saying yes that yeah, yeah okay yeah that should be 1200 it's all it's all very quick thank you um, <laughs> I can't believe how a couple of those are wrong. <laughs> so this one should be 1200, thank you. Um, and you can also see here that like for 2n squared, it's like, okay, they're all twice as long as this. But the thing is, is that when you're dealing with large numbers of input, um, the, the n squared is what dominates it. Like the n squared totally dominates everything. Uh, it dominates all the other components. And what we mean by that is like an n squared algorithm with a million inputs takes 1.3 hours. But a 2n squared plus a thousand uh, time algorithm for a hundred thousand inputs um, takes like 16 minutes, right? So it's like, sorry, it only takes like twice the time. You can kind of see this here. So firstly, this constant factor disappears really quick. That's one easy thing. Um, I was just reading the chat. So the constant factors always disappear. You should always, you should get that pretty quickly, right? Um, okay, so anything that's constant time, we don't worry about too much. If you have a program that needs to do one malloc at the start, and that malloc takes like five milliseconds or a hundred milliseconds, it's like, damn, that's a lot of time. But if you're only doing that once in your function forever, it doesn't matter how much input there is. For large inputs, it's, like, it's the actual processing that'll take forever, not the malloc at the start. One thing people have said though is that, oh, it's pretty crazy that this like 2n squared thing is like twice as fast, right? It's like, oh wow, like this one is 1.3 hours, but this one is like a whole extra 1.3 hours. Um, yeah, there's a couple of typos in here. I'm really sorry. This is, it was a lot of slides just to write a lot of numbers in. And um, I'm, thank you for pointing them out and for being so patient with me writing some new slides. Um, you're all the best. Uh, the timing is pretty, pretty accurate. Um, but the point here is that when you're actually writing these programs, um, the reason we, reason we get rid of these, these constant factors out the front and the other things is because we don't really care about um, whether it takes 1.3 hours or 2.6. Because generally speaking, we're operating in like big chunks. Like if you're writing an algorithm, you're generally going to be like, I need it to run in a couple, like a couple seconds. Like instantly, a couple seconds, a few minutes, a few hours, or a day, right? It kind of be the things you're thinking about. And the actual thing that's going to affect that the most is that n squared thing. So for example, if you're writing an algorithm that takes a time of 2n squared plus 1000, and you're trying to optimize it, right? Generally, you have large inputs. Because for smaller inputs, it doesn't matter how efficient your program is, it all just gets done in a second, right? But for larger inputs, what's actually making this huge here is that n squared. It's nothing else. It's not the thousand. If you make that thousand part really quick, it's not going to speed anything up. If you make that two part really quick, it's not going to really speed things up that much. Sometimes that matters. The, the factor part kind of has a, bit, has a little bit of an impact on things you do. But generally for large, large scale programs, like if you, have, if you have a program that you need to finish like in a second and it's taking 16 minutes, no one's going to be like, Hey guys, I removed I removed the two out the front and now it's eight minutes. And everyone's gonna be like, Thank you. Thank you for that. That doesn't help at all. What really helps is turning this n squared into something smaller, like an n would be great. I mean you look at this one here, right? We've got this program here, two n squared plus a thousand. It takes two point six hours. Someone gets rid of the constant factor, someone gets rid of the, the coefficient out the front. They they got it down to one point three. They halved the time. That was it. Now let's look at what happens if someone magically, through their big brain, goes from um, 2n squared plus 1,000 to 2n plus 1,000. They figure out how to write an algorithm that um, only takes n instead of 1,000. Well, what did I say that was for a million input, was it? Was it a million? Yeah, so now a million is going to take 2 times a million plus 1,000, which is 2 million, like that, it's that, which is approximately 0. Like it, like that. 
So, so you managed to like, okay, you got rid of that, that constant factor grate, you got rid of the coefficient grate, you turned it from 2.6 hours into 1.3 hours. But if you found an algorithm that has a smaller dominating component, a smaller higher order n part, you can turn your algorithm from something that goes from like 1.3 hours back to like 0.01 seconds. Like we're talking about like earth shattering differences in speed, right? Massive, yeah, like huge. Um, and you can see this, like I, I've, I mean, that one's a pretty, it's very hard to turn an N squared into an N, so I don't want to like lead you on into thinking you can just do that quickly, but like there are lots of ways like where you can learn to turn something that's like N into log N or N log N into N or N squared into N log N. Usually you can knock it down a little bit, right? Um, a good example, like Sakaya said, in Python dictionaries can often replace loops. Yeah, so in Python, Dictionaries have a constant time lookup. For, this is just a throw out for anyone who's used Python, which means that like if you have a list of a million items to check if something's in the list, you typically have a worse case of having to do a million checks. Whereas a dictionary, because it's a constant time lookup, is constant time. So suddenly you can go from an N to a one, which is instant. Um, and that's that's literally what this course is about. This this freaking table, this this few slides here is, is everything we're talking about. Um, uh, I think I just want to give a throw out to some of the comments James is making here because um, they are relevant, which is like, while in this course, we try and capture you for a moment in time and say we're just going to focus on like big O notation, which excludes things like constant factors and like um, coefficients out the front, which is really good for teaching you about algorithms at scale. In reality, a lot of programs we write aren't at scale, um, which isn't really what this course is about in a lot of ways. But it's something you need to think about because if you're writing a really simple program like a um, like a sort function, like a really basic sort function or something, if your sort function is like like if your inputs if you're only ever taking like ten inputs or a hundred inputs, which is better, a program that's like a hundred n plus ten thousand or a program that's n squared, right? Like for ten inputs, which one's better? Clearly the second one. Clearly this n squared algorithm is better. So when you're dealing with um, a small number of inputs, which again in reality is actually probably how a lot of your general programs will work. Uh, that coefficient out the front in particular has a big impact on things, but a lot of what we're trying to focus on in this course is trying to help you come away from that um, and then think about, okay, well, how does this program actually behave like at scale? And that's why a lot of these big tech companies will get you to work on things like this because, you know, you imagine you're applying for an interview at Google, they're going to be like, oh, well, um, you know, I don't know what they work on, but you can imagine that some crazy stuff, you know, algorithms that are scanning the internet and everything else, right? They need to be fast. Everything needs to be fast. Or video games. You know, you're making a video game with only so much uh, processing power and stuff. Uh, well, it says, am I correct in saying Big O talks about a growth? An N squared program can run faster in real time than an N program, depending on their initial speed. So mostly, I don't, I don't think it's like, it can run faster for a small set of inputs, right? Again, so what big O notation tells us is like, it, yes, it is about growth, but I think like that's a little waffly for me because it's like, what is the tendency of this? Like, what is the tendency of how long this algorithm takes to run at scale is how I think about it. Because as you, as you do grow, as you approach large inputs, most other things kind of fade away into the background. And that's kind of what your focus is on. Like, again, if you have a program that takes 2.6 hours, you're not going to be thinking about how to halve it. You don't care. Like, either 2.6 hours will be totally fine. Like, it's like an overnight job that you're running. Or it's going to be, like, beyond ridiculously too slow. Right? Like, you're like, oh, let's write an algorithm that just, like, does this. And it's loading a web page. And it's like, ah, oh, come back in 2.6 hours while we run our algorithm. You're going to be looking for something to bring that down to that, like, 0.01 seconds that I talked about. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I think I'd, we've we've gone quite slow today, which I'm not, like, that sad about because I think this is, like, an interesting and critical topic to go through. But um, I do just want to touch on something that Jay just said around... I'm just trying to find some code. So this, this can actually also help you understand programs a bit more because um, if we have a program like this 
you now understand that the reason this is so slow is because of this double loop. Like, that's what the killer is. So if you actually had two double loops, as kind of James was, or three, all this is actually going to do is turn your program from like an n squared algorithm now into a three n squared algorithm. By the way, this doesn't actually work. I'm not like, this isn't like a, another type of sort. I've just copied and pasted code. Um, and because it's three n squared, you know that with big O notation, three n squared is also n, n squared. So you're not actually increasing the big O notation by doing repeated things like that. So generally loops are the killer. Like this is all big fancy wancy stuff that's like maybe a bit complicated, but fundamentally we're basically trying to reduce the amount of times a program has to loop. Um, and as we learn more about different data structures, you'll understand that it can get more interesting than that. Now, let me just have a look at what we have left to do. Oh yeah, and this is a diagram kind of just explaining things we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes. Why remove things? Yep, because n squared grows quicker, even though it might be like, even though an n program might be, uh, oh, sorry, even though a 100 n program might be slower to start as it scales, it it's gets quicker than the n squared one, right? That's what this diagram is demonstrating. Um, does big O factor in concurrency of operations? Uh, not really. Big O is honestly a lot about data structures and algorithms. It's about what data structure and what algorithm did you choose, which is why this course is called Data Structures and Algorithms. Um, okay, so the last thing we have in this lecture is to do a... We're basically going to write a binary search. Um, we don't have enough time to do it. So what we'll do is we will do this at the start of the next lecture. Um, for like 15-20 minutes and then we'll keep going with the next lecture and uh, yeah, see how we go. Um, probably be fine tomorrow, but I don't know. Again, this is my first time taking this course, so a couple things I'm not familiar with how long it takes. Um, yeah, so we'll go through search tomorrow. Search is really interesting. It'll help you understand a different type of time complexity as well. We're going to talk about log stuff. Um, if we don't have enough time tomorrow to finish off the uh, abstract data types lecture, then I'll just record part two over the weekend or something like that. Um, yeah, so we're going to do a QR code. We'll, even though we're doing a little bit more of this lecture tomorrow, we'll just do the QR code now. Um, here's the QR code. So if you could uh, vote and stuff. Um, I, when I said tomorrow, I probably meant Thursday. I'm sorry. If you could just vote and tell me what you found of this lecture. Was it interesting? Was it boring? Blah, blah, blah. You get the point. Um, I hope I have all the right field values there. Oh, oh no, I don't. Give it, don't, don't answer it yet, please. Just let me refresh. Don't, um, don't, don't submit it. Uh, and uh, performance analysis. All right. Okay, it's there now. You should be able to refresh and enter it now. Thank you. Sorry. I'm such an idiot. Um, just adding more in now. Great. Yep, thank you so much for filling that in. Really appreciate it. Um, it's really helpful to learn about you and everything you think. Yeah, the lecture's over. It's 3.55. Um, we'll touch on this on Thursday. Um, and I hope this was interesting. Um, learn a little bit more about computer science. So thanks, everyone. You're such a great sport and crowd. It's great to have such good questions and such engaged students. And I hope your labs and stuff are going well. Um, you really do have a collection of such smart tutors in this course, so feel free to use them. And if you have any questions, just post them on the forum. And um, see you on Thursday. Um, Waleed, no, I think you can do the quiz now. Quiz is now fine. I'd do the quiz now. Cool. Thanks, everyone.